falling away to the Antichrist. Now, Paul here has outlined two frightful things that will strike the church just prior to the Lord's coming. Jesus said, as Paul said, Jesus will not come until these two awful things happen, and they're going to happen also in the church. Two things. Number one, a great falling away, a great apostasy in the church. Secondly, a spirit of Antichrist overcoming many who are backsliding. A spirit of Antichrist possessing many who are in the church. Now, folks, for years we've been preaching and teaching about the coming Antichrist. And we've been expecting a man, the son of perdition. Some have speculated that that man has already been born, that he's somewhere on the earth now, and perhaps even a man, and soon to take power. Now, is there such a man as an Antichrist? I say, yes, there is a man of Antichrist. He's going to come one day, and he's going to be well-received, and I'll tell you why he's going to be well-received. He's going to be well-received even by many who were Christians, who have been prepared for his coming, and he's going to be revealed, and the only reason he's not revealed now, it's not his time, and the Holy Ghost is holding it back. But one day the Holy Ghost will lift his restraining hand, this man will be revealed, he'll be incarnated by Satan, he will demand and receive the worship of mankind, and then when his work is finished, his time is done, the Bible said he's going to be consumed with the mouth of our Holy God. But there is an Antichrist spirit, just as surely as the spirit of Jesus Christ abides in us. The scripture said, because you are sons, God has sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father. Now, we have a Christ, a living Christ, who is a man now in glory. He has flesh, he has bone, he has hair, he has eyes. He's a living man because he has still got his manhood, even though he is God. He's a man in glory. He is there and we are here, but his spirit is here. We are living through the spirit. I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. Who lives in me? The spirit of Christ. There is a man, Antichrist. You see, there are two Christs in the world, Jesus Christ the Lord and Antichrist. Antichrist has a spirit. There is a spirit of Antichrist that is even now moving in the world, preparing for the coming of this man. Just as sure as you as a believer have the Spirit of Christ in you, there are people today that are absolutely possessed of the spirit of Antichrist. And I'm going to show you today how, how it is overpowering many churches and that some churches, believe it or not, are directed by the spirit of Antichrist. Paul warns that there is coming false prophets who will preach another gospel and another Jesus. That other Jesus is the Antichrist. And they're going to be of the spirit of Antichrist. And there are going to be many apostate Christians in the last days. But folks, while we've been looking for this man, Satan has been creeping in and by his spirit preparing. So you see, Antichrist is not going to suddenly appear on the scene and try to overwhelm mankind. Antichrist is not going to come and try to influence people. By the time he has come, there will have been first a trickle because Paul the Apostle said that spirit is already at work. It was at work in the primitive church. It's been working now. It's up to a stream. It's up to an ocean flow. And the Bible says by the time the Antichrist is revealed, he will have already prepared the hearts for his coming. They will receive him. How will many receive him? Why would certain so-called Christians, backslidden apostate, ever turn to the Antichrist? Because they are of his body, of his spirit, and like-minded. And he is now in the world preparing hearts to receive him when he comes. And there are some sitting here now, believe it or not, who are going, if should the Antichrist be revealed in our time, are going to quickly, openly receive the Antichrist. Because... You have already had the seed, the spirit of Antichrist planted in your heart, and we'll go on with it here. Paul said, for the mystery of iniquity did already work. It's already at work. The spirit of Antichrist, Paul said, is already at work. He's already moving. He's already taking position. He's already coming into power. I want you to go to 1 John, please. Second chapter. 1 John, 1 John 2, 15, verse 15, begin to read with me. Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh and the lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. But the world passeth away and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God abideth forever. Now listen to this, little children, it is the last time. 
How many believe that? How many believe this is the last time? Folks, if it was the last time when Paul wrote this, or John wrote this, could you imagine how late it is now? Almost 2,000 years later, how much closer, how more real is this text? Little children, it's the last time you've heard that Antichrist shall come. Even now there are, what? Many Antichrists, whereby we know that it is the last time. It means that there are many that have been infiltrated and possessed by the spirit of Antichrist. The spirit of Antichrist, John is saying, is already moving. It's in many hearts. The spirit of Antichrist. There are many, not, not the man, not many Antichrists, but the spirit of Antichrist in many. <clears throat> now, in this passage, John is telling us those whose hearts are still in love with the world, those who are still bound by lust, have opened themselves to the spirit of Antichrist. The lust of the flesh, the lust of the eye, the pride of life, it's not of the Father. Who's it of? It's of the Antichrist. And there are many that are still given over to that. I want you to go to verse 22. Who is a liar? But he that denieth that Jesus is the Christ. He is what? Antichrist that denieth the Father and the Son. Look at me please. Anyone, John is saying, who has not come under the total lordship of Jesus Christ, has opened himself to the spirit of Antichrist. If you sit here this morning and he is not Lord of everything in your life, you've given him a portion of your life, you're serving him 90%, but he is not totally Lord in your life. You have denied him, you've denied his Lordship. It's not that you go around cursing his name, but you have denied him. You have not believed to him for full salvation. You have believed and trusted him for half salvation. You are not serving him with all your heart and mind and soul and body. You have opened yourself, according to John, to the inroads, the inmaking of the Antichrist spirited into your heart. This is so very, very clear. Whosoever denieth the Son, the same hath not the Father. But he that acknowledges the Son hath the Son, Father also. It's not just to say, well, I believe Jesus was God in flesh. It's saying, Jesus, you are God in flesh in me, with all power and all authority over lust, over sin and everything else, and I yield to your Lordship. Those who are righteous, who worship God in spirit and truth, are the prime targets of the Antichrist spirit. Verse 4, who opposeth and exalteth himself above all that is called God or that is worshipped. Look at me please. This spirit of Antichrist is opposed to those who walk closely with the Lord Jesus Christ, those who walk with God in intimacy, and those who are worshippers. This is what the devil is after. This is what the Antichrist wants for himself. And he's going to come against everybody. He's going to come against every true believer who walks in the intimacy of Jesus Christ. He's going to come against you with everything the Antichrist possesses. That spirit, that invading spirit, he's going to come against you and try to attack you and try to get you to stop worshiping. He'll try to stop your intimacy with the Father. He'll try to give you doubt and fear about the advocacy of the cross of Jesus Christ. He will do everything to make inroads to hinder your worship. There's nothing the devil wants in this church more than to worship. To kill and destroy worship. That's what he wants in you more than anything else. He will do anything. He's not out to get you to be a drug addict, an alcoholic, prostitute. He's not trying to get you to lie and steal and curse. He'll do that only if it disturbs your worship. He'll do it only to rob God of his praises. He's after worshipers. And if you're a worshiper, true worshiper, don't be surprised when all the everything out of hell comes against you when the antichrist spirit comes and tries to knock you away don't be surprised by it who opposeth and exalt himself above all that is called God and all that is worship Paul warns that a spirit of lawlessness is at work in the world and in the church and we know and now we know that what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time verse 6 look at it now we know what withholdeth that he might be revealed in his time? What? Who is withholding the Antichrist from taking over the whole nation and the whole world right now? The Holy Ghost. The Holy Spirit who abides in you. Not the Holy Spirit that in some cosmic atmosphere. But the Holy Ghost in the church. The Holy Ghost in you and I. And it's this church and other Holy Ghost church and Holy Ghost people that are holding back the anarchy of hell and Satan in this city. They talk about the crime rate going down or up. Folks, if the Holy Ghost was lifted from this church and other churches, this city would be a raging hell right now. Because the stench of hell is already in our schools. The stench of hell is in our courts. The stench of hell is in our churches. 
And can you imagine what it would be if the Holy Ghost begins to step aside and say, be revealed. It's the Holy Ghost holding back the storm. Once you go to 2 Peter, 2 Peter, 2 chapter. Folks, I'm going to tell you something. Listen to me before you, before you read this. Careless, lazy Christians are going to be overcome. They're not going to be able to stand. You're careless about reading your Bible. You're careless about the things of God today. Folks, the perilous times that are coming and the, the, the closer, you see Jesus says, closer we get to his coming, there's going to be ever increasing light. And folks, there's ever increasing revelation, ever increasing power of the Antichrist is being released by the devil right now before the full revelation of the, of the Antichrist. Because when he comes, he's coming, it's just going to be the last step, like stepping through a piece of tissue paper. It will have all been prepared. The hearts are ready, all prepared for his revelation. He's not going to have to prepare anything. It, the devil will have already prepared it. The spirit of Antichrist will have already accomplished his will. And sadly, many Christians are going to be overcome. I want you to start reading with me verse, the second chapter, second Peter, verse 17. He's, he's speaking to the church and certain ones in the church. These are wells without water, clouds that are carried with a tempest to whom the mist of darkness is reserved forever. For when they speak great swelling words of vanity, they allure through the lust of the flesh, through much wantonness, those that were clean escape from them who live in error. While they promise them liberty, they themselves are the servants of corruption. But of whom of a man is overcome, the same as he brought into bondage. Now listen to this. For if after they've escaped the pollutions of the world through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, these people claim to be saved through the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. You see that. And then it says, then they are again entangled therein and overcome. The latter end is worse with them than the beginning. Now folks, listen to me. There are going to be Christians overcome by the spirit of Antichrist that's at work right now. They're going to be overcome. These are those who have escaped the pollutions of the world, who were delivered by the power of God through the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. But now they've turned aside, for it had been better for them not to have known the way of righteousness. They knew the way. They knew the way of righteousness. Then, after they have known it, to turn from the holy commandment delivered unto them. But it's happened unto them according to the true proverb. The dog has turned to his own vomit again. The sow that was washed to her own wallowing in the mire. How many, look at me please. How many do you know who have turned away from God? And they're going back to their old habits. They've gone back to their old world. Folks, I'm going to tell you, you don't just backslide. You don't just fall away from the Lord. Now, he has to be talking about the church because what does the sinner have to fall away from? He can't fall away from anything. He's already in the pit. The only falling away are those who had something. You don't just fall away from Jesus. You fall into something. It's not just the falling away. It's falling into. You fall away from Christ and you fall into the spirit of Antichrist. No one simply backslides. It's a falling into something. Falling into the spirit that's in the world trying to take control. Now folks, listen to me. John proves that the spirit of Antichrist is powerfully at work in the church. I want you to go to 1 John 4 now. 1 John 4. Verse 3. And every spirit that confesses not that Jesus Christ has come in the flesh is not of God. And this is that, what? Spirit of Antichrist. That's what I've been talking about. Whereof you have heard that it should come, and even now, what? It's in the world. It's in the world now. John said, you've heard that the Antichrist is coming. You heard a man is going to come and be worshipped. But he said, wake up. That spirit is already at work. And he's talking to the church. That spirit is already here. The spirit of Antichrist is at work. Even now, already in the world, that spirit of Antichrist. Go back to 2 Thessalonians 2, 4. So that, verse 4, who opposeth and exalted himself above all that is called God, or that is worshipped, so that he as God sitteth in the temple of God, showing himself that he is God. Now folks, look at me. Quit looking to Jerusalem. Quit looking to the rebuilding of the temple where this man is going to come in and set himself up. He's already on the throne. He's already in his temple. You say, what, what is the temple? What is the temple? Go to 1 Corinthians, 3rd chapter. 
Did you know he was going to sit in the temple of God and show himself to be God? How many know that? He said he's, he's going to be revealed. He's going to sit in the temple of God and show himself to be God. All right, 1 Corinthians, 3rd chapter, verse, verse 16. Know you not that you are what? The temple of God and that the Spirit of God dwelleth in you. Go to chapter 6. Familiar scripture, but I want to show you something. Verse 19, what? Know you not that you're, this is 6, 19 of 1 Corinthians. What? Know you not that your body is the temple of the Holy Ghost, which is in you, which you have of God, and you are not your own. Go to 2 Corinthians 6. Do you want to establish this well in your mind? You're familiar with it? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God, as God hath said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their people, and they shall be my people. Look at me, please. How can such an incredible, awful, frightful thing happen that at one time, the living God sat on his throne, ruling and reigning in a vessel? How is it? Now that the Holy Ghost has departed and that temple, that throne of the heart has been vacated through lust, through pride, through covetousness, through gossip, through slander, through all of the things that we've been warned about time after time after time. How is it that we, as many Christians who have grown careless, who don't walk righteously before Him anymore, and how is it that the spirit of Antichrist has moved in now and taken over and according to this second Thessalonians the second chapter he now sits in his temple show himself to be God in other words he is in control he is absolutely in control there is always going to be a Christ on your throne I don't care where you are serving Jesus or serving the old there will always be a Christ on this throne it will be Jesus Christ the Lamb of God or the Antichrist there will be a Christ. Every man walking these streets has a Christ on his throne. We know the Antichrist is in full control of the secular media. All secular television, theater, all the networks, all the printed material, all now are under the control of the spirit of Antichrist. What, who but Antichrist could so bias the American press and so bias the editors and the writers and the actors so that abortion is called a right rather than a sin. Who but the Antichrist could justify now euthanasia? Did you hear recently, or read in the newspaper, a psychiatrist now in the United States who believes in euthanasia, killing off the old and infirm? He's willing to kill off anybody who's mentally ill. Who but Antichrist is a killer? Kill off the old and the infirm. It, we ought to be shocked in the United States because in the Philippines and in Asia, they honor and they revere their old folks. Those who are old, they're revered. Here, we want to kill them. Who but the spirit of Antichrist could be behind it? Who but Antichrist could mock everything that's sacred and holy and worshipped and filthy movies and wicked, vile programs on television? The Antichrist is producing MTV. Literally, the Antichrist spirit is in full control of Fox television. I, I read, I don't watch that stuff but, uh, because I don't have television, but MTV, from what I read, and Fox television, in a newspaper, you just look at some of the reviews and some of the absolute filth. Who but the Antichrist? Who but the spirit of Antichrist could be behind it? And folks, he's getting bolder and bolder. Our society is on the brink of becoming a raging hell. But sadly, that same Antichrist spirit is moving rapidly into the church of Jesus Christ. We talk about the gates of hell not prevailing against the church. But folks, you've got to know that he's talking about a certain church, an overcoming holy remnant church. He's not talking about that great church mess that's out there being ruled and reigned by the spirit of Antichrist. He's talking about a particular church called out from the world. Only that church will prevail. The gates of hell will not touch that church. But I'm telling you right now, all over the United States, the spirit of Antichrist is absolutely establishing churches. That's exactly what this new uh, outsider-friendly gospel is all about. Who but the Antichrist would go out 
door to door and knock on doors and say, do you go to church? No. Well, what would you like your church to be like so we could get you to come? And based on a survey, what people want, they don't want sermons, so they have skits. They don't want two hours, they want one hour. And they want no conviction. And so what we have now is another gospel with no cross, no repentance, no judgment. But you are allowed to sit there and be soothed in your sins. And you are told about the grace and the mercy of God. But nothing of his judgment, nothing of hell, nothing but heaven and mercy and grace has become a license to sin. Oh, but the Antichrist would build a church on a survey. What would you think if I went out, I went out in the streets and I found all the kids that are playing hooky from school. And they don't go to school. You say, well, what kind of school would you like so I'll build a school that you would like? But you tell me what you want in a school. You know what we'd have? Two hours a day, three days a week. One to three o'clock. No lectures, 15 minute, no algebra, no calculus, no science. And we want nothing but pizza and snacks for noon. And we want no lectures. We want no laws, no rules. We want to come and go as we please. We want no grades. We could have the biggest school in New York and every dropout would run. I could go all over, write books and tell everybody about the successful school in New York that was designed on a survey with teenagers dropping out of school. From now, when they've been prepared for nothing, not prepared to live, what are preachers going to do when they stand before the throne of God? And these people have not been prepared for eternity. They don't even have, they heard a message on hell. Never heard a reproving message. What's going to happen when those preachers stand before God? It's a damnable thing from the pits of hell. It's the Antichrist spirit. Who oh, but Antichrist can tell people they can drink from two cups. The cup of the Lord and the cup of demons. 1 Corinthians 10. I'm going to tell you something. As long as I'm in this pulpit, there will not be one person. And I know that too with Brother Carter. We will not babysit this people. You're going to hear the heart of God. First Corinthians 10. Verse 20. But I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice the devils and not to God. Now I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. You cannot drink the cup of the Lord in the cup of devils. You can't be partakers of the Lord's table in the table of devils. Do we provoke the Lord to jealousy? Are we stronger than he? You know, folks, I, I have a pastor friend who just delights to get up and tell his congregation, if, if you're really mature in Christ, you can handle all of this stuff. He's talking about movies, he's talking about television, he's talking, if you're mature, you can handle it. No, folks, it's not a matter of handling it. It's a matter that you can't have fellowship with devils. It's a matter you can't drink out of two cups. You drink the Lord's cup or the devil's cup. You can't sip out of both sides. You say, Pastor, that it's scary. How can a Christian be overcome by the spirit of Antichrist? Well, there are two causes Paul gives in 2 Thessalonians. Go back, please, to 2 Thessalonians. Cause number one. Now, folks, if you're ever going to be given over to the spirit of Antichrist, here are the reasons. I'm going to give you two. They received not the love of the truth. Verse 10. And with all deceivableness of unrighteousness in them that perish. Why? Because they receive not the love of the truth that they might be saved. Now, look this way, please. Verse 12 says, and they will all be damned who believe not the truth. Most Christians simply endure the truth and don't appropriate it to their hearts. Will you please go to Jeremiah, the fifth chapter? And folks, I'm preaching you Bible. Chapter 5, verse 1, run, run you to and fro through the streets of Jerusalem and see now and know and seek in the broad places thereof. If you can find a man, if there be any that executed judgment, that seeketh the truth, and I'll pardon it. And though they say the Lord liveth, surely they swear falsely. O Lord, are not thine eyes upon the truth? Thou hast stricken them, but they've not grieved. Thou hast consumed them, but they've refused to receive correction. They have made their faces harder than a rock. They've refused to return. Look at me, please. This, this is so very vital. God saying, Jeremiah, go find me some man. Go find me anybody that just has a heart for the truth. 
I'll pardon that one and I'll use. But he said, look what's happening to the people. They say that they love me. They say that I rule in their lives. But he says they don't receive correction anymore. They don't want to be reproved. There's anger in their heart. They're not grieving at the preaching of the word. When it cuts to the marrow of the bone, they call it anger. In, in, in verse 30, he said they're not stricken. They don't grieve. They refuse to receive correction. They've made their horses, hearts uh, harder than a rock. They say the Lord lives in me. Most people sitting here this morning would say, Oh, I love God's word. I, 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 I haven't lost my love for the word of God. Let me give you... Three ways to determine whether or not you have the love of the Word of God in your heart. All right, first of all, you have lost your love for the Word of God if it's a difficult job for you to get to church. And you're bored, and you don't look for it, and you no longer look forward to the assembling of yourself with believers. The Scripture said, Forsake not the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, but exhort one another, and so much the more as you see the day approaching. The Lord is saying, the closer we are to the coming of the Lord, the more perilous the times, the more important it is that you gather with God's people. There are some that get so excited. They, they just love coming to church. They come every time the doors are open. Now, I know some of you have family obligations. You have job obligations. And God understands that. I'm talking about those who sit at home. Those who become bored. They don't want to hear the message anymore. They're just bored. It, the house of God is not alive to them anymore. They drag themselves. If you're dragging yourself to this church, God help you. You're opening yourself to the spirit of Antichrist. The second way you can know that you're losing your love is by reading someone else's name into the message instead of your own. You can hear a raging, powerful message and say, Oh, thank God he's finally reaching brother so-and-so. Thank God, Sister Smith, she's got it, she's getting it. God, pour it on her. How many of you have taken this message to heart right now? How many of you being moved and convicted in your own heart and you're not thinking about anybody else? You're saying, God, pour the word into my heart. Sign number three, when reproof angers you rather than humbles you. But you've said it not on my counsel. You did not want my reproof. You despised all my reproof. Proverbs 1, 30. Correction is grievous unto those who forsake the way. I've heard people say, oh, uh, I've heard said of Brother Carter's messages like mine, it's too hard. He's angry. Oh, you better believe we are angry at the devil and sin and everything that would attack God's people because we're shepherds. We're angry at that and not at people. But the Bible said, Correction is grievous to those that forsake the way. And he that hateth reproof shall die. He that hateth reproof shall die. All right. Let me, cause number one is a, is a loss of love for the word of God. Cause number two, verse 12. That they all might be damned who believe not the truth, but had pleasure in unrighteousness. Look at me. Pleasure madness. Pleasure madness. Folks, I'm coming near the end, but I've got to get this into your heart, if you will, please. But they had pleasure in unrighteousness. I want to prove to you right now that in the last days, that the lovers of pleasure are going to be more inside the church than outside the church. When we think of lovers of pleasure, we're thinking of gamblers and we're thinking of prostitutes. We're thinking of drug addicts. We're thinking of the jet set. We're thinking of those that are out in the bars and the racetracks. We're thinking all the lovers of pleasure are there. That's what the Bible says. Second Timothy. Just turn right. A few pages. Third chapter. Second Timothy 3. Verse 1. This know also that in the last days perilous times shall come. For men shall be lovers of their own selves, covetous, boasters, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, false accusers, incontinent, fierce, despised of those that are good, traitors, petty, high-minded, lovers of pleasures more than lovers of God, having a form of godliness but denying the power thereof from such turn away. Look at me. Listen to this list. Blasphemers, unholy, truth breakers, false accusers, fierce, traitors, in God's house. This is in God's house, folks. 
That's what Paul is talking to Timothy about. He said, beware. These are going to be, this is going to be the spirit of Antichrist in the last days. They're going to be those who are in love with their pleasures, the pleasures of unrighteousness. The pleasures of unrighteousness. He said, because of this, this Antichrist spirit is going to come in. Because they don't love the truth and because they're given over to the love of pleasure. Now, it says more than the love of God. It intimates that there's a measure of the love of God. But there's more of the love of the world. He's talking about so-called believers. And folks, if you sit here this morning... You have not laid down the pleasures of this world. And he's talking about the pleasures of unrighteousness. I, I want before I close, I have to get this off my heart. Listen to me now. Because you, you will stand on the, before the judgment seat and I'm going to be there when you pass under the rod. You go ahead and you go to the show, go to a movie, pluck down your five or six dollars. And you sit there and listen to me good now. You sit there and you sit there while there's blood and violence. And you sit there while the name of Jesus Christ is cursed and mocked and run through the mud and trampled. And the name of your holy God is cursed. And I'm going to tell you what you've done. You've just drunk from the cup of the devil. You have fellowship with demons and you've provoked God to jealousy. And you have supported the Antichrist spirit and the Antichrist spirit that Satan, Satan sees where you're at. He knows where you're sitting in the seat of the ungodly. And you're going to sit there and you're going to take that. You rent a movie and put it in your VCR. Now, folks, I'm, I'm not standing here uh, saying in our office we have VCRs and we watch the tapes that come in. We are taping this right now on, on video. I, I'm not against that. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about when you go and you go past those dirty movies are even PG-13 now. Even PGs curse the name of Jesus. Do you not even have the grace to get up and walk out? Do you sit there? You wouldn't sit there and let them curse your wife. Or your husband. You wouldn't sit there and let them curse your... They named your children like that. You would get up and scream and say, stop it and run out. And yet you'll sit there and let the name of your Christ... Be maimed, sit in front of television and watch filthy, filthy, rotten stuff, and let that spirit of Antichrist seep into your soul, provoking the Lord to jealousy. You know what it is? It's called a sacrifice to the devil. That's what God calls it, a sacrifice to demons. God help us. They're going to be just the precious body, Paul says, who are going to rise up against the spirit of Antichrist and they are going to stand strong. They will never be overcome. They're going to overcome the world, the flesh, the devil. They're going to overcome the wicked one, the Bible says. Hallelujah. Verse 13, 2 Thessalonians, second chapter. But we are bound to give thanks always to God for you. Here's that special people. Brethren, beloved of the Lord, because God hath from the beginning chosen you to salvation through what? Sanctification of the Spirit and belief of the truth. Oh, look, look for just a minute. I really believe that this church, the great majority that are sitting here this morning, you're here because you love the truth. You're not afraid to be reproved. And because of that, God sanctifies your spirit. He sanctifies your mind. He convicts you when you've done wrong so that you don't run out there saying, oh, everything is all right. But you examine your heart before the Holy Ghost. The word, a sharp two-edged sword pierces and it heals you. Hallelujah. Wherefore, he called you by our gospel to the obtaining of the glory of our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, brethren, stand firm or fast and hold the traditions which you've been taught by word of our epistle or our epistle. Now, our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God, even our Father, which have loved us, given us everlasting consolation and good hope through grace, comfort your hearts and establish you in every good word and work. Hallelujah. Folks, keep your heart open to the word. Love the word of God. God will establish you. When that Antichrist spirit comes in like a flood, the word of God lifts up a standard against it, cannot make an inroad to you. The more wicked this world becomes, the more righteous you will become in the name of the Lord. I'm going to give you one last verse, Psalms 125. 
I want you to take this promise home with you. Psalms 125. Folks, you got to memorize this. First three verses. They that trust in the Lord shall be as Mount Zion, which cannot be removed. Oh, let the devil rage. Let the Antichrist spirit come. You won't be moved because you're on the word of God. Hallelujah. Verse 2, as the mountains are round about Jerusalem, so the Lord is round about his people from henceforth even forever. Listen to this. For the rod of the wicked, that's the rod of the Antichrist, the rod of the wicked shall not rest upon the lot of the righteous, lest the righteous put forth their hands unto iniquity. Look at me. He's got a rod. That means authority. But his authority and his power and his reign will not come upon the righteous. Shall not rest upon you. But God said, I'll give you power and authority. You will not be overcome by Satan. You will overcome the world and overcome. This is... The faith that overcomes the world, even even the testimony that overcomes the world, even our faith.